this cord is really bothering me. <laughs> Dominic Harvey, 26 years old, from Toronto, Ontario, currently residing there at least. Mono Green Tron is his weapon of choice. He can make it so that Tron wins everything this weekend. 12 2 and 1 due to Swiss. Fifth open top eight this year for Dom. Looking for his third open win. Bobby Colgrove, 23 years old from Columbus, Ohio. Very close this tournament was for him. Hogak, his weapon of choice. Obviously a good one. 12 and 3 through the Swiss. These players are going to get ready to rock and roll, everybody. Obviously, two of the very best decks in modern. Might just be flat out the two best decks underneath the London Mulligan rule and everything else that's going on. I know that might be a little hyperbolic. I think Hogak is certainly one of the best decks. But Tron's results this weekend, given how many people played the deck, pretty hard to ignore. I mean, there's a lot of Jund in the room that's floating around as a fringe option. The Hogak matchup seems at least fine. And we might be looking at the best deck in the format in absolute terms, squaring off against perhaps the best metagame call you could make under current circumstances. When you've got all these people loading up on the graveyard, hey, rest in peace, then lay line, and how many decks did we see with four lay lines in the sideboard? And then you think about how many Blood Moons and Fulminator Mages and, and Field of Ruins and stuff we saw this weekend. Look, mm -hmm. Tron's lands, Dominic Harvey's lands probably not get blown up very often this weekend. Doesn't doesn't appear to be the case. Yeah, had to be pretty easy mode for him knowing I can just build my Tron, everyone's going to leave me alone, and sure, someone might have a Blood Moon, but I've got that covered with Nature's Claims and various other ways to kill it. And some incidental graveyard interaction, Game 1 and Relic of Progenitus too. So it's not even like you're just, you're not turning Game 1 into a pure race. Mm -hmm. you, can, you can actually interact with them a little bit better than most decks in the format can. I think you can interact with them just enough get your engine online, if you find something like an Ugin or a Warm Coil engine, mm -hmm. they're pretty helpless. They don't have a lot of outs to something like that. So these players are going to take a look at their opening hands. Probably going to see a decent amount of mulligans here because that's what this deck does. I, excuse me, both decks do. Mono Green Tron up to Phoenix. And then we'll watch these players do their thing. Dominic Harvey on Mono Green Tron. We'll get that updated here very quickly. And then Bobby Colgrove on Hogak. Harvey on the play given that he is the number three overall seed against Hogak, which is the number eight overall seed. Impressive that Bobby's been winning on the draw here in the top eight, but that just shows some of the power of his deck. Yes. Pretty hard for the eighth overall seed to win a modern event, no matter what the deck or the matchups are. Mm -hmm. So this would be quite the impressive run. We'll see if Harvey wants to keep this hand or not. And he does not. So let's go over to Bobby Colgrove and see if he wants to keep his opening hand as he takes a look at his first seven cards of the finals. Going to give it a long look. Remember, Tron is a deck that does mulligan oh so well underneath the London mulligan rule. We already saw Harvey win on a mulligan to four. Oh, yeah. And he made it look honestly pretty darn easy so this is a deck that certainly doesn't mind the new london mulligan rules a lot of decks certainly do like it but some decks i think take advantage of it more than others yeah well, certainly decks that are trying to just put together a few discrete pieces are gonna uh, make better use of it mm -hmm. than decks that are just you know lands and some spells That's a, uh, you know, it, the, the rule is not, it's not a subtle thing. You've got to go back to the drawing board in the way that a lot of the matches play out in the aggregate because whatever your win percentage was against Tron, it was subsidized by some games they didn't have it. Well, some games they just didn't even get to play. Right. Yeah. And a lot of those games are gone now. Now it seems like every game they get to play, it almost feels like the mulligan like a dredge deck used to. Yep. Or they're just looking for piece A plus B plus piece B, and the rest will take care of itself as Harvey's going to head on down to five cards now. And in most circumstances, if you see your opponent mulligan at five, you do that little mental fist pump. You go, all right, all right. And it's still good here, you know, mm -hmm. because it's a, you know, they still have to have the three lands and then something to do with it. So the cards do matter, but the them mulliganing down and then just going turn one, Urza land, turn two, forest. Those are the easy mode games, yep. and those are largely gone. On a mulligan to five, Harvey can find Tron Land, Tron Land, Expedition Map, two payoff cards. Right. It could be two payoff cards. Or like a relic. Yeah. And, be, and be more than happy with that. That's what can happen here.
And Dom is trying to figure out exactly what cards he wants to put on the bottom because I think he's thinking he's going to keep this one. All right. Our modern classic top eight is being announced right now. We had nine rounds in that classic, so. A long, a long that's, tournament. That's a long tournament. That means it was a big tournament. Players are loving modern here in Columbus. We're underway. It's Nurse's Power Plant. And a Relic of Progenitus. Well, makes some sense to me. Vengevine the draw here for Bobby Colgrove. Bloodstained Meyer. Harvey's going to take care of that right away before the fetch even resolves. He's sharp. Yes, yeah. late in the day. He's sharp. Overgrown two minutes. The battlefield untapped. Citrus Supplier. We'll see a trigger here in just a moment. Three cards and we head into the graveyard. The Bloodstained Mire, of course, was exiled via the Relic. Vengevine, Gravecrawler, Gemstone, Mine here for Bobby Colgrave. Some hits could potentially be good enough for uh, Harvey to make a move with the Relic this turn. There's a Relic activation. You see the tower and the map, along with the ability to activate Relic to take care of an entire graveyard with the mana available. So this is a pretty nice start here for Harvey. His hand right now has an Ancient Stirrings. Not entirely sure what the other card is. Hopefully we'll get the opportunity to see it soon enough. Seder Wayfinder is the draw. Gravecaller will be cast from the graveyard, given that Stitcher Supplier is a zombie. Blood Crypt enters the battlefield untapped. Next up, Insolent Neonate Trigger. The Vengevine. Relic will take care of that. Neonate resolves. The player comes into the red zone. Let's head back over to Harvey now. Harvey with the forest. This is a stirrings. He'll take a look at the top couple of cards. That's a chromatic star. Not exactly what the doctor ordered. And he'll pass. Black Cleave Cliffs the draw. You would like to see, if you're in Colgar's position, uh, a, a big turn, ideally involving Hogak, uh, because Harvey is threatening an Ugin next turn, and if your battlefield is nothing but small creatures, it's very hard to come back. Seder Wayfinder is going to trigger, take a look at the top couple of cards. Faithless Looting, Seder Wayfinder, Insolent Neonate, and Grave Crawler are placed into the graveyard. Now we're going to see Neonite do a little sacrificing. And discard a Vengevine draw a card. That's a new one there. Bit of a split card here. Well, it looks like it's Claim Fame. Let's see if that works itself into the equation here. As there's a Black Cleave Cliffs. We've seen some unique flex cards all weekend long. Haven't seen that one yet, though. And now Gravecrawler from the graveyard is cast, which means Venzvines is going to join the fray. And now Hogak will too. Beatdowns for six. That grave crawler. Ah, I see. One of these grave crawlers should be able to attack. And one will. There is Claim Fane. Return target creature card with converted mana cost two or less from your graveyard to the battlefield. Fame gets a little creative there. You can cast both sides of it though. I think, I think Claim is actually probably going to target Stitcher Supplier more often than not. Yep. Yeah. And Fame can give you some uh, combo kills with Hogak. Ah, nice. Okay. That's pretty cute. Yeah. Get a little plus two on there, too. Well, Harvey's got his mine. He's got access to his eight mana. And he's got access to an Oblivion Stone. And that'll do a nice job of buying him some time. Yeah, not a permanent solution to these recursive threats, but... It is a lot of breathing space. Mm -hmm. 
And the Stone is going to take care of everything. So Callgrove's going to put all those creatures in the graveyard. One thing about Hogak that is quite powerful, though, is the Stitcher Supplier is going to die. Three cards will be placed into the graveyard is that this deck can rebuild real fast. And yeah, I think we're going to watch it do that. If you're not exiling things, it's, it's not hard for this deck to uh, get everything back very quickly. Stitcher Supplier, Blood Gas Grave Crawler, and a Marsh Flats. Seder Wayfinder. Venge Vines are back. Four cards are headed to the graveyard. Well, let's make it three as Overgrown Tomb will be going to the grip. And I think it might be the Gak attack. Now, there is a little something interesting going on here in so far as Bobby might have some interest in leaving Hogak in. Well, he's got two down there. He's got some interest in leaving Hogak in the graveyard because of claim fame. Mm -hmm. And the ability to actually just get one back and go a little crazy. So Overgrown Tomb is going to enter the battlefield untapped. Blood Ghasts are going to come back. A nice thing here with convoking maybe six creatures, you don't have to remove very much. Yeah, I mean, the, the, the graveyard, it, the amount of stuff in there is not going to be a limiting factor yeah. here for Cold. Actually, you have to remove nothing to convoke Hogak onto the battlefield after the O-Stone. Dude, sweet O-Stone. It's a fog. <laughs> it's a it's eight mana fog, but it's a fog. Well, any Ugans over there, big guy? Boy, this deck. <laughs> oh, this deck. Three colorless. Down to two. Let's make it one and one. New card coming. There's a Tower of Power. You know, this is one of those game states where a card like Unlog isn't even particularly good. It's not bad, but it's not great. Three mana. All right, the old Fogaroo. Yep. Run it right back. Yeah. Callgrove's turn is going to look somewhat similar to the last one, I'm sure, as he'll draw. Beatdowns, O-Stones, make them all leave. That one and Carrion Feeder might change the equation a little bit. We'll see. Cast a Grave Crawler. Venge Vines will come back. Yeah, we're going to look at uh, essentially another full reassembly here in one moment. Mm hmm. Cast a Grave Crawler. Cast a Grave Crawler. <laughs> we'll lose a land from the graveyard. Put Hogak back on the battlefield. You're up. Carn ain't it. Warm Coil's not it anymore now, by the way. Given the carrion feeder. Right. Mm -hmm. Blast Zone is a uh, touch slow, though it does kill four creatures in the battlefield momentarily. But Hogak and two Venge Vines would still get through. All right. So, a man of floating. He's going to use Blast Zone to take care of all those one-mana creatures. Okay. Okay, so no mana floating. Pardon me. It does take three to activate. So now there's a Walking Blista and a Worm... Mm. Does he want to play Walking Blista for one? Worm Coil's in there. Worm Coil, very powerful in this spot. All right. I mean, it, it leaves... Uh, I wouldn't say Colgrove has no good attacks, but they've definitely gotten a lot worse. Well, if you're Colgrove in this spot, I think you start off by... I think you. I think your attack is probably just Hogak. Yeah, if you attack with everything, then he goes up to seven and needs a Vengevine. Mm-hmm. 
I don't know. Maybe that's okay if it's I still, trivial. I, for, I, I, I still it, think that's fine. If it's trivial for you to get the Ventrivine back, then that's better than attacking with just Hogak. Yeah, attacking with only Hogak puts him at 17. You attack with Hogak, you trample for two, but your opponent gains six. You lose your you lose so, your Hog you lose your Hogak. It's net. He goes up to 17. I mean, yeah. it's just so much cushion. Well, he loses, but he loses his warm coil. Sure. And then he has two three threes, and you just get to replay your Hogak. Yeah, but it still might be better to attack with the bench find to put him at seven instead of seventeen. If Perhaps. all the stuff comes back anyway, who cares? Well, here's claim. Citrus supplier is a target. That's a zombie. That's gonna get back all the grave crawlers. So now those cards head over to the graveyard. Yep, I, I I'm into this. Because Dom gets a little bit of value, but not very much. Actually, he doesn't really get anything from this. Because the Vengevine's just coming back. Right. Yeah, so he gets and nothing from this. Colgrove gets through a little bit of damage for his trouble. Yeah. Vengevine dies. You play a Grave Crawler, Vengevine comes back. You can play more Grave Crawlers. Yep. More Grave Crawlers. Pass the turn back. Ugin, where are you? Although the Ballista is not shabby in this spot either. Hmm. It just makes combat a little tricky the next turn. Because you have a chump lock on a Venge Vine, plus you get to shoot down a bunch of stuff. Really, I, I, don't, I, I don't think it makes it that tricky. I, I think we're just going to see him attack with everything every turn. I'm, I'm more speaking to it might give Harvey one additional turn. Sure. Not that it makes combat uh, that complicated, as you said, I think. Colgrove just sends and everything, and it shakes out however it shakes out. Yeah. He probably makes some forward progress on dealing damage. Let's see what this is. It's got access to 11 mana, does Dom? A scrying, maybe? Okay. Yeah, if the last card here is a Ballista, we might see him go get Sanctum of Ugin. Yep. And you still have 10 mana left over after you play your land. So you get to make a 5-5 five, five Ballista. So 5-5 five, five Ballista, trigger, searching. The Sanctum lets him dig a little something out of the deck now. So whenever you cast a colorless spell with converted mana cost 7 or greater, you may sacrifice Sanctum of Ugin. If you do, search your library for a colorless creature card, reveal it, put it in your hand, then shelf your library. Note that it's colorless creature card, not colorless card, so mm -hmm. can't search up Ugin itself. But can get Ulamog, the Ceaseless Hunger. And it's possible, uh, it might be worth a check here. D does Callgrove die from one attack trigger from Ulamog? That's a good question. Because if you get out of this turn, you one tap, you play the Ulamog. Ideally, you get out of the following turn, and then is one attack trigger good enough? Because Callgrove's done quite a bit of self milling and looting and all that. Blood gas are going to come back, and those are going to have haste. And perhaps that changes the equation on the game. That's a carrion feeder. Uh, now we get to give this haste is, or, or something. <laughs> it's the most adorable deck I've ever seen. Hogak is now a 10 power creature. Yeah, there's nothing else efficient to put the, the fame onto here. The Hogak's unlikely to get blocked regardless, and if it does get blocked, it's the uh, best thing to give Trample to. Mm -hmm. I like that one of. Makes it, it seems good. Fun thing to mill over, too. Yeah, yeah. Just tend you out of nowhere with Hogak. We've seen so many different one ofs all weekend long. Abrupt Decays and Lightning Axes and Lotless Trolls. Forgot about those Aftermath cards. Yeah. Which is easy to forget about. Didn't see a, a ton of play. 
in their standard format. I've run into a little bit of claim to fame alongside um, Dreadhorror Arcanist. Powerful thing to get back. That's powerful true. thing to give haste to. Yeah. Bumps the power. Right. Yep. Yeah. It's a yeah. A lot of little. A lot of nice little things going on with that combo. Walking Ballista is going to try to get some work done here. So Carrion Feeder is eating things that Walking Ballista would be shooting down. Six six. So here we go. So if you're looking to save damage, the best block is Worm Coil in front of Hogak and a Walking Ballista in front of a Venge Vine and then shoot a Grave Crawler before damage. So you are net plus two on the Worm Coil, gets you to nine. And then we're looking at six coming across, so Harvey survives by my by my accounting. You've got Hogak as a 10 power creature? Yes. So you pick up, you take four, but the Worm Coil is six, so you net two. This all assumes that Call Grove allows it to happen. I would assume he's not sacking to carry and feeder here. If you block a Venge Vine, you shoot a Grave Crawler before damage. You have six points of damage coming across. So that's, you survive even setting aside the fact that the Worm Coil Hogak combat is net plus two. Whether you're, that's good enough to get out next turn, that remains to be seen. Mm -hmm. So he'll sacrifice Hogak to Carrion Feeder. Shoot there. So this is going to leave Harvey at one. One, yep. Now he's got Ulamog in hand. Is that good enough for anything? Well, if you knock out the Carrion Feeder, then Colgrove has to do something about the Worm Coil engine to make headway in combat. So you Ulamog the Feeder and... And what? F you start with Feeder, for sure. I mean, I, I, I would imagine Venge Vine. Venge Vine, maybe? Phil? Well, the, the, only reason, the only reason I'm thinking about Grave Crawlers is because you just want to eliminate zombies because Grave Crawlers get back other Grave Crawlers. Um, it, well, I, that also, now that depends on whether or not one Ulamog attack trigger is lethal. Sure. Because you don't care about him getting some Grave Crawlers back if you just win by, by moving by, combat. By, by 20, you, by hit, deck you, hit you for right. 20 cards. So the exact number matters here a lot. Okay. It's also but I guess, the, I guess there's no difference between the Venge Vine and the Grave Crawler in terms of combat, right? It's just the same, just small, non-trampling creatures. Who cares? Mm-hmm. But I also think you're starting to get to the point where you need Worm Coil Engine to attack to go up to seven, well, potentially. The, well, the, 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 the other thing to be mindful of is the blood gas coming mm -hmm. back because they'll have haste. and So the particulars of the math, I believe Cole Grove is hellbent. Am I? He is hellbent, yes. Unsure if he has any faithless suitings in the graveyard or not. That could definitely change the equation. Dom's got to take a look again, too. Remember Dom when he won in Pittsburgh a month ago. He was playing the broken version of Hogak with Bridge from Below oh, and Alter Dementia, so he's familiar with how this deck operates. All right, so there is Ulamog. The reason that the Carrion Feeder is such an important thing to get in this spot, it, it's twofold. One is... It's just the biggest thing. Mm -hmm. And the other is having the carrion feeder gives Colgrove a lot of agency in terms of whether or not he wants to engage with the worm coil engine or not. You can just sacrifice the thing that the worm coil blocks. If you're going to attack with worm coil engine anyway, that becomes less of a priority. And you can focus on either going after lands or going after the grave crawler or whatever. So Colgrove's going to sacrifice both creatures that Ulamog is targeting. And now the decision is, do you attack with Worm Coil Engine or not? And keep in mind, part of, part of what's going on here is... Hmm. And now we'll see. It looks like nothing to go get. Okay. Um, Colgrove is Hullbent. So either he draws 
a carrion feeder, in which case combat's still not very good for Callgrove, can't do anything. Or he draws something to get back the blood gas, but if that happens, he has no path to sacrifice the creatures in combat, and the worm coil engine again becomes a prohibitive blocker. So I think not attacking is correct. So let's go back over to Colgrove now. It's hard for it to be both a sack outlet and a way to get the blood gas back when you're hellbent. It's kind of one thing or the other. He's got it. He, he's got a Golgari thug in the graveyard. So you can mill over some cards and then cast the thug or fa flash back the faithful sitting, I suppose. We also, you know, again, we got to keep in mind that the specifics on Colgrove's deck size really matters here because if he's just iced by Ulamog moving into combat, then it's it's just do or die this turn. Draw two. Neither are lands. Well, the way he's reacting leads me to believe that he doesn't have much. Well, it's hard for him to have everything because if it's a sack outlet, he can't make much of a move in combat this turn. And if it's something that's just some creatures, then he's, uh, it's just too imposing, the Worm Coil Engine's too imposing on defense. Well, the count begins. Yeah, Ulamog's going to kill him. Wow. Wow. Dom is going to win with the Ulamog attack. So, Dom Harvey is going to win game number one here over Bobby Colgrove. Mono Green Tron with those very expensive fogs known as Oblivion Stone. Hang on long enough to win that first game. Worm Coil Engine still a really big issue for Hogak. Mm -hmm. you, you saw in that game that uh, Colgrove had a pretty, what, a seemingly dominating battlefield. But Warm Coil Engine was just too prohibitive to work around. It, it was too good on defense, provided too much agency in blocking. And once Harvey was able to shut out the sack outlets, there was really no way for Colgrove to proceed. Sideboard time, everybody. Let's start with those four thoughts uses and four ley line of the voids there for Bobby Colgrove, along with two Assassin's Trophy, a Force of Vigor, a Shenanigans, a Plague Engineer, a Fatal Push, and a Nature's Claim. He's got a lot of artifact removal. Yeah, you know, you got to have the, 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 force, the Force of Vigor, and, uh, you know, because Harvey has the ley lines in his sideboard, you, even something like Nature's Claim is probably good enough to get over the line. Um, I don't know. I, I, Thought sees, I could take it or leave it. The Hogak players that have been watching deep in the tournament, it seem, seems, have not been bringing in Thought Seize against Mono Green Tron. I don't know if that's right or wrong, but an easy card to either bring in or leave out. For Dominic Harvey, four lane on the void. Those ones are pretty obvious. Three Nature's Claim, three Veil of Summer, two Dismember, two Thrag Tusk, and Nemer Cool the Promise End. We've talked about it all weekend long. It just seems like ley lines and nothing else. Yep. Yeah. Even if they have an answer to the ley line, typically it requires them to spend their second turn on an Assassin's Trophy, and even that level of breathing space, plus the Assassin's Trophy no longer being eligible to go after a Tron piece, is enough for it to be a huge advantage. And if they happen to not be able to answer it, they can't really play. Well... Those are the options there for both players. That's one hell of a first game there for Dom Harvey. Able to win that one over Bobby Colgrove. Did not look like that was going to be a game he was going to be able to win. Those Oblivion Stones were merely acting as overpriced fogs that were blowing up the battlefield, but they were good enough to buy him enough time to get a Warm Coil Engine on the battlefield. The Walking Ballista bought enough time, and then the Ulamog ate the right permanence and milled over the last 20 cards of the deck. Not always the way that Mono Green Tron gets it done, but it was that particular game. Whew. Let's talk about the StarCityGames.com weekly sale real quick here, everybody. 33% off select Mythic Rares through Monday. Karn Liberated on the graphic. Karn Liberated might be hoisting the trophy here for Dominic Harvey in just a moment. The Johnny Strength of the Pride, Nickel Bolus, Dragon God, the Mimeo Plasma, and a whole bunch more. You can find them over at go.starcitygames.com slash sale. This one's going to end at 10.59 East Coast time tomorrow morning. That's Monday. But the new sale will happen one minute later at 11 a.m. East Coast time on that same Monday. New goodies up for sale at go.starcitygames.com slash sale every single Monday. Bookmark the link. It'll make life easier for you. Are you looking at the sale? No. No? You're looking at beta lands, aren't you? Alpha. Alpha, okay. Got some islands. Can't get them to focus on anything. When would you get these? Just a few minutes ago. Nice. It's pretty nice. Yeah. Seven of them? Eight. Just eight. put them in the box. Four, five, six, seven, eight. Stuff them in the box. This guy's been through a lot. Oh, boy. Oh, yeah. These have been, these have some people played like, some magic with some those. People, some people like the, the near mint alpha stuff. I appreciate that it's rare. For me, HP is the way to go. I want something with a, some story behind it. Something mm. that has seen, mm. some, seen some things. You want to know how they got those scars. Right, I got exactly. You. I got you. These islands have cast quite a few Mahamodi Dijans in their day, I'm sure.
We're going to get ready here for game number two between Bobby Colgrove and Dominic Carvey. It's a tough, fantastical monster. <laughs> it's a tough first game for Colgrove to lose. <laughs> He'll be on the play in game number two in just a moment. Dominic Carvey, number seven on our player of the year leaderboard. He's looking to qualify for the Players' Championship. We've seen him in almost everything this year. We'll take a look at our Season 2 standings here very quickly, folks. Let you know where everyone does stand coming into this tournament. This, of course, will be updated on Wednesday on the homepage of StarCityGames.com. But Erin Barrich, she's leading things with 52 SCG points, mostly off the back of that big win in Worcester a couple weeks ago. Beat Ross Merriam in the finals, did Erin. And Jeremy Bertarioni, well, he won, he won uh, excuse me, yeah, he won Pittsburgh, pardon me, with, with Dom. Pete Ingram. He won Philadelphia. Joseph Horton has had some nice finishes, as has Christopher Johnson. Ross Merriam, a second-place finish at SCG Worcester. Ashford Smith and Jonathan Hobbs, they run out the top eight. And I think if we get to that second page, you're going to find Ben Riley, Joshua Satterfield, and then number 11, Dominic Harvey, with 30 points. We'll move up to 57. Mm -hmm. And then he's right in the thick of the conversation. If Oliver Tomiko showed you anything last year, it only takes one event to get you back in the conversation to qualifying for the Players' Championship via the seasonal rewards. Zach Allen, Harlan Fear, who had another top eight here this weekend, Sam Lawrence, Aiden Breyer, and Kane Reinhardt, who won a classic last weekend in Philadelphia, round out our top 16 on our season two standings here on the SCG Tour. So... Either way, it breaks here for Dom. He's going to be in the thick of things once again. Came up a little short in season one. And it's off to a great start once again here in season number two. But this one's not over just yet, folks. Bobby Colgrove is playing an incredibly powerful deck, as you just saw. The ability to put so much power on the battlefield every single turn of the game is difficult to match up with. But Harvey was able to do it just enough to win that game. That was a really impressive. It's, it's rare that the... That this, game, that this matchup in particular goes that way, that it's actually played on the margins. Mm -hmm. Usually it's one person uh, either getting overwhelmed in the case of the Tron deck or not really being able to play in the case of the Hogak deck. Rare to have it in the middle where both decks are kind of doing their thing. And the particulars of combat math and people's life totals are, are really the thing that determines the outcome of the game. That was a fun one to watch. That was. Game two. That was a really good game. That was great. It was a really, really good game, actually. I did not think Harvey was going to win that game. Looks like Hallgrove's going to take a mulligan. Well, I thought if he was going to win that game, it would it would involve one play that shut the door. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? And it kind of was a, a bit more of an incremental process than just, oh, well, Ugin showed up. I was, was yeah, I was waiting for the Ugin top deck. Right. No, That's what I was waiting for. Kind of just played through it. <laughs> <laughs> those, those Oblivion stones. Just good enough. Just good enough. Also needed to be Oblivion Stone because they work in the attack step. It can't be oh, some yeah. other, like, yeah. it can't be, like, not that it's playing all as dust, but it needs to actually be Oblivion Stone in that spot. Right, yeah. right. It all, it all mattered. Call Grove going to take a look once he did Mulligan. They're going to put some cards in the bottom from the London Mulligan, so it looks like they found hands they can keep. I think they're just trying to figure out who goes first, and maybe they're putting the cards on the bottom. I'm not quite sure. Or I think there's some confusion about if I keep six and you keep five, do I scry before or after? Mm-hmm. Well, we're underway. <laughs> That's cool. Yeah, we're going to have to do it uh, on a hard mode if we're Bobby Colgrove. Well, the Force of Vigor is your answer to this spot. That's true.
I'm actually surprised the deck doesn't play a, a do a little bit more than that. I see a lot of these decks that have like one copy. And it just seems like the Assassin's Trophy takes too long and the fact that you give them a land matters too much. I think the fact that you give them a land matters a lot. A lot of the time I feel like getting out of getting out from underneath the ley line is nice, but the land actually matters right. for the opponent like way more than you would think. Yep. But you know, you only have so many green cards too, so it's not like it's easy to load up on Force of Vigor. Mm -hmm. So I don't know. There's Carrion Feeder. Here come the beatdowns. Now the plan here could be simple. Dom doesn't have a lot of cards to work with. And perhaps his hand is slow. He's got even more graveyard interaction there in the relic. And slit neonate. Beatdowns. And maybe I can attack my opponent to death before they complete Tron. Or perhaps that's wishful thinking. Yeah, well, Kalgaro's got the Assassin's Trophy. He can't play it right now, but I would bet that that's uh, going to be targeting a Tron piece more than the Leyline. The Leyline thing, that ship has sailed. Unless he finds the Force of Vigor, we're not interacting with yeah, that. I, I think we're going to be targeting, if he draws a green source, that Blast Zone. Yeah. There is an attack for four. Yeah, I mean, Blast Zone's an issue. <laughs> <laughs> Venge Vine will be... These cards are all going to be exiled. Dom will be pointing that out. Draw a card. Sater Wayfinder. A bunch of those in hand along with an Assassin's Trophy. Pass the turn back. And Dom does not have mana source number four. So, okay. That is a Marsh Flats. All righty then. Sacrifice there. Now, part of me, if I'm Colgrove with this Assassin's Trophy, part of me doesn't want to give Dom green mana. He right. might be short on that, so I might just go towards Seder Wayfinder here. Yeah, I think if, if you're... What what do I do with the Assassin's Trophy? If it's an imprecise guessing game, you might as well just put something on, on the battlefield. Well, he's going to go with Assassin's Trophy right now. Uh, I mean, this is really risky because, for example, this this unlocks, you know... But Harvey's hand could easily be no green mana mm -hmm. and a Sylvan Scrying. Mm -hmm. And now, you know... You, you've unlocked a little bit. Yeah. That's my concern if I'm Call Grove here. He'll attack for three. He's going to put Harvey down to eight. Part of me wants to just play Sylvan. I want to play... Seder Wayfinder. Seder Wayfinder. Sacrifice it to the Carrion Feeder. Let's get in for four and just try to kill my opponent really fast. Maybe, and maybe that's wrong. Maybe I'm just supposed to keep the Wayfinder because it's a, it's a two-mana creature in the face of a Blast Zone. But giving my opponent green mana when they didn't have any feels a little risky. Yeah, it just seems like there's so many elements of Harvey's hand that could be uh, missing or... Maybe the Assassin's Trophy is better served on the payoff card somewhere down the line. Um, but, you know, he would have to draw untapped mana uh, and not need a forest really badly for that play to work out. We'll see, I guess, the nature of Harvey's hand here momentarily, but... Uh, There's a scrying. That forest unlocks Sylvan Scrying and Ancient Scrying, which unlocks a lot of other things and potentially, too. Mm -hmm. It's risky biz. And once... once I mean, with... In this kind of game, with Colgrove being this start on resources and not having access to his graveyard, when Harvey shuts the door, it's going to be completely shut. Mm -hmm. there's, there's not going to be an opportunity to get back into it. Oh, there is a Seder Wayfinder. Top four cards. Well, Seder Wayfinder here, you know, you can attack Harvey down to four. Yep. And... He's got lands three and four rolled up here, so it, optimistic you might be able to knock him down to four, have Harvey sweep the board or do something else, and then uh, a hasty Vengevine, could, hard cast, could just be good enough. Well, that could be the plan. Uh, for Colgrove, you've got to make sure you play the right land. It's a big deal here. Because his hand right now is Blackleaf Cliffs and Gemstone Mine. That might seem like a minor thing, but if you play this in the wrong order, that means that the Blackleaf Cliffs would enter the battlefield tapped right. on turn four. So. But also, Colgrove kind of wants to conceal the nature of his hand a little bit. Mm -hmm. So you'd like to play the land that Harvey already knows about, ideally, to prevent him from, from necessarily registering Vengevine as a possibility or a likelihood next turn. You sort of give away the game a little bit here, but there's no choice. I mean, yeah. you just have to be in a position to cast next turn. You really do have no choice. So Harvey, without a Blast Zone anymore... What would he find with Expedition Map? Would he want another tower to have more mana, another green source? Who knows? He's drawn plenty of graveyard hate this game with two ley lines and a relic of Progenitus. So this is the position that Colgrove has show, is set up now. A Planeswalker is no longer good enough. You sweep the battlefield. You die to the Vengevine. A Wormcoil Engine is also no longer good enough. 
because you block one thing, that gets sacrificed to the carrion feeder, the remaining attackers are lethal. Okay. So all that's very good. The cards that Colgrove is not set up to beat, as things currently stand, uh, Ulamog is a major problem. Yes. Either it pins the lands or it uh, pins the two threats, and oh. then, then you're in trouble. Yep. Walking Ballista, also a big problem. Gives uh, Harvey a lot of agency in terms of uh, manipulating blocks and preventing damage. I'm sh I am shocked he's not sacrificing that map. I don't know why he wouldn't. It's not nature's claim, right? And he also has a redundant ley line anyway, even yeah. if that was the thing. I don't know why he wouldn't want to get land out of his deck and have access to more mana. Yeah, interested to see how this one goes here because Harvey, d does he, is Vengevine the thing on the radar right now? Because there's a lot of the plays that appear to be haymakers, planeswalkers, worm coil engine, what have you, that are not good enough in this spot. Well, there's no stone. My question, does he have more mana? Well, he's, okay. He can, okay. So if you already have a tower in hand ready to go, mm -hmm. then you could wait on the map because maybe you want uh, another Tron piece yep. or maybe you want a... Sanctum. Depending on how things go. Yeah. I mean, Sanctum and Ghost Quarter are, are probably of interest now. And Ghost Quarter normally wouldn't be of interest, but the fact that it can blow up a green source matters. Right. Because if you're worried about Vengevine, then there's no forest in the deck. So uh, it's a pretty good bet that it just keeps them off for at least a turn, maybe two. Now, what is a little bit interesting about... Oblivion Stone here is the fact that it blows up those ley lines, but I don't really think that we're really caring about that that much given the given the texture of this game. Well, Colgrove's down to very little in hand and no graveyard to speak of. So yeah, losing the ley line is painful, but also uh, you might feel like it's already done its work, and if you can transition to the next stage of the game. Uh, here's the easy part, which is just attack with my four power worth of creatures, try to kill you. Harvey's going to sacrifice his expedition map first. We'll see what land he wants to go get. Again, various specialty lands in his deck. Blast Zone already gone. Ghost Quarter still an option. And Sanctum of Ugin still an option, assuming that they're in the deck. It's been really fun uh, watching this finals where we've watched this matchup now several times. And the shape of it in the week, on the weekend is one person just trucking someone else, mm -hmm. either running you over before the game gets off the ground or locking out your graveyard and playing a fast worm coil engine. And so far we've had two games where the decks have gotten to do their thing to varying degrees. And it's been a really close game on the battlefield. So, we are going to see Oblivion Stone be sacrificed here in just a moment. Harvey's going to have to tap his mana and get his Ley Lines off the battlefield. There we go. There's Seder Wayfinder. Vengevine. Force of Vigor, Graveclaw. These cards are actually in the graveyard now. Keep that in mind. So, the graveyard is back to being an option for Bobby Colgrove. Overrun Tomb's going to enter the battlefield taps. Colgrove's going to pass the turn back. We go over to Harvey. Does Harvey have some sort of payoff now? He'll play a Sanctum of Ugin. He has an Ugin. He'll sack there. I think he's got to get Walking Blister, right, partner? Well, uh, again, if he's uh, if he's respecting Vengevine as the thing to play around here, then... Well, what's unique about this spot is I think he has to now because you see the... I think it's probably on his radar because there's a Vengevine in the graveyard. Now, I don't know if he's got Walking Bliss in his hand or not, but he just passes the turn back. So if you're Bobby Colgrove, you play that and you win this game. So Bobby Colgrove is going to win game number two here over Dominic Harvey. Hogak, able to come back from two ley lines and a relic to win game number two over Mono Green Tron. Look at these two go. Yeah, it's 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 an interesting uh, feature of this matchup where if Harvey opens on ley lines, it's probably going to come at the expense of uh, his ability to quickly assemble Tron. He's going to keep a lot of hands that sort of take that shape. And part of the, the dimension of this Hogak deck is they can just play to the battlefield a little bit. Uh, Colgrove was able to do a lot of, the, they, they weren't the hardest beatdowns, 
but it was enough to get Harvey in range where he had to use some cards inefficiently and uh, was eventually killed by a haste threat. Well, they are going to shuffle up as they always do here for game number three, our last one here in Columbus. We've got a crown of champion, and we're going to do it right after we hear from our friends over at Ultimate Guard. Game number three about to be underway here. Our final game at SCG Columbus. Dominic Harvey, Bobby Colgrove getting ready to figure out who's going to be the champion here this weekend between Mono Green, Tron, and Hogak. Two very, very good games thus far. I'm hoping the third is the same. Yeah, no, they've been they've been close and interesting and hard to play. Just not really what we've uh, historically seen uh, or. Historically, it's maybe too <laughs> strong a word, but given, thus given, far, yeah. okay, the recency, but th thus far this weekend. What a fun little tournament. Really has been. Seen a lot of awesome stuff. A lot of different decks. I mean, you know, we got to see an, a really crazy couple of games from Breach Shift earlier. Mm-hmm. Seen a lot of Hogak, of course. Unclear just how good Is It Phoenix is moving forward. We had one in the top eight. Humans didn't perform particularly well this weekend. Wonder if that deck's on the outs now. That's another deck that, uh, I mean, people have claimed that they like their Hogak matched up just fine. Uh, I think the reality might bear out something a little bit different. I think I'm inclined to agree. Some Flyers and Reflector Mage seems like it could be good enough, but just the gap in power level of the two decks, I think, is too too big. It's not small, said Gap. Harvey keeping seven. There's been a ton of mulligans so far in this, mm -hmm. this match. And looks like Colgrove's going to take another one. So he'll be looking at a few less cards here in just a moment. Well, he'll be looking at the same number well, of cards. Well, you're correct. Right. Excuse me. If I'm wondering, I have to get used to that, actually. While he does another mulligan here very quickly, folks, let's talk about the StarCityGames.com YouTube page where you can watch the replays of this open versus live with Ross Merriam, Todd Anderson, and the newest member, Corey Baumeister. We got Commander versus with Jeremy Knoll, Justin Parnell, Jonathan Suarez, and the American Dream, Stephen Green. Flashback with Brad Nelson, Todd Anderson, Ross Merriam, and many others. Best of SED Tour moments and our SED Tour archives all live there and a whole bunch more. Subscribe today at youtube.com slash starcitygames. Become one of over 150,000 subscribers. Mm. That's a big number. That's a lot of those. That is really loud. That's a really loud table being put away. Leyline of the Void, Expedition Map, or is this Power Plant is where we begin. An overgrown tomb here for Bobby Gull Colgrove, and that's just going to end the battlefield tapped. For Harvey, it's a forest, so it's no turn three Tron. 
And he'll just pass the turn back over to Colgrove. Gravecrawler the draw. He's going to have to get a little bit dirty with these creatures, like we've seen him do already. Assassin's Trophy in hand to take care of the ley line appears to be the plan. Harvey just going to pass, expecting to lose his ley line, and he does. So something interesting that, that happened there, Harvey electing not to crack the map, uh, wants to be able to draw a second piece and then find the third piece. Mm -hmm. I think a lot of people, as a reflex, just crack their expedition map. If you don't think you're under that much time pressure to do it, uh, then you're better served just taking the draw step and giving yourself the best opportunity to complete drawn. Gravecrawler on the stack after the Wayfinder did its thing. Dismember is going to kill the Wayfinder. Smart play there from Harvey, no surprise. What that does is there's not enough creatures on the battlefield to convoke Hogak right now. So Hogak has a turn delayed. We head back over to Dom. He'll play a Stirrings, looking for one of these Tron lands that's not a power plant. Yep. He's got a lot of looks at it because he can fill out the rest with the expedition map. There's the mine. His patience is being rewarded. He'll take Nurse's Mine, he'll play the mine, and the map can find the tower. He's passing. We're going back to Bobby now. Faithless loot in the draw. We know how powerful that card is. Yeah, that opens up a lot of uh, explosive sequences here. Three mana to begin. Maybe not. Looks like he'll just hard cast Faithless Looting instead, instead of flashing it back. Yeah, I mean, part of the reason to, to maybe flash back is that you have Blood Gas plus a land, and so you can get the Hogak onto the battlefield and get your Blood Gas for your trouble. But I think... Uh, the opportunity to really spike something huge with the Faithless Looting and spend your mana doing other things as well is powerful enough because, you know, the writing's all the, on the wall from Colgro's perspective. He's got to get something really major going on this turn because Harvey's going to have Tron plus nine total mana next turn. And, uh, you know, whatever's going to happen is going to be bad. He's got to try to get a lot on the battlefield right now. Hardcast of Bloodgast. Return of Hogak. Something real is on the battlefield now. Now here comes Vengevine for four. Harvey's down to 12. Heck of a turn there from Colgrove. Blood Crypt enters the battlefield tapped. And now we're going to see what Harvey can do, and he's got access to nine mana. We've talked at length and just how good Ugin is in this matchup. Now would not be a bad time for the Spirit Dragon. Because I think, I think Harvey's hand is, is rolled up with heavy hitters. I have to imagine it is. He didn't do much in the early stages, miss a land drop. So you know he's got spells. Yeah. There's your Tower of Power. Now there could be some misses in there too, something like a Ley Line, which is a bad draw. He started the game with one. Well, he's staring lethal damage in the face right now. He'll start with two colorless, going to go down to one. Go to Chromatic Sphere. Sphere will yield him a card. It's going to transform into a green. Access to eight mana now. There's an Oblivion Stone. We've seen how good that is for him today. He'll pass the turn back over to Colgrove. Colgrove's going to untap. He'll draw a card. There are plenty of good draw steps here. He's going to start by just attacking. That's the easy part. Ostone's going to blow everything up. So what's Colgrove going to do in his second main phase is the question. Faithless Looting is probably not a bad place to start. And so that's where he will start. So it's time to draw two. Hogak is one. I believe Force of Vigor is two. Not the best faithful suiting here for Bobby. He'll lose a gemstone mine and a Hogak. He'll play a Marsh Flash. Trigger, get back the Bloodgast. Bloodgast is a Spirit Vampire. 
so it can't get back grave crawler. So we head back over to Harvey, and his battlefield's relatively clear. Dom's got a decent amount to think about. Yeah, looks like he's tapping seven. He'll go towards Warm Coil Engine and Expedition Map. Notably not cracking the map right away. Yeah, I mean, he wants that the, the, the flexibility there to either get a tower or uh, maybe a Sanctum or a Blast Zone, depending mm -hmm. on how Colgrove's turn goes. And he showed such patience with his plays. All top eight long. And ideally all weekend long. Otherwise, I don't think he'd be where he is right now with this deck. There's Carrion Feeder. And now Grave Crawler, which gets back Avenge Vine. But all of this amounts to very little if you can't do something with the Worm Coil Engine. Mm -hmm. Which we saw in the first game. Now, I believe Colgrove does have Force of Vigor in hand. He'll sacrifice the Marsh Flats. Going to fall down to 19 by doing so. Uh, looks like he might be thinking Blood Crypt. Okay. It's going to end a battlefield untapped. So perhaps we go towards Faithless Looting from the graveyard? Doesn't really have a whole lot else going on. So Call Road falls down to 17. He'll use four on the Convoke. Looks like he's going to get rid of a land, two lands and a Hogak to cast Hogak and leave Faithless Looting in the graveyard. He'll sacrifice Gravecrawler to grow the feeder. Do that a couple more times, I think. Shortcutting a little bit as he goes. Okay. So now the feeder is a 5-5, five, five, so that's a pretty good turn. That's a lot of power on the battlefield. We head back over to Dominic Harvey now. <laughs> it's Warm Coil Engine versus the world, folks. <laughs> But, I mean, an, an Ulamog here could potentially shut the door. Because, you know, again, once Colgrove is without Carrion Feeder, uh -huh. he's got to engage with the Worm Coil Engine straight up. And that's too hard to do, even with a battlefield as, as large as Colgrove's appears to be. Blast Zone was the find off of that expedition map. Blast Zone will enter with a counter. That's a lot of mana for an Ulamog, I think. Yes, it is. Carrion Feeder is one. We'll see what number two is going to be. It's going to be the Gak. We'll see him sack both. First the Gak and the Feeder to itself to put them into the graveyard. But Ulamog has arrived, and it is safe to attack with Worm Coil Engine. So Harvey's up to 18. Colgrove's down to 11. And Ulamog is unassailable. There's mm -hmm. no hope of Colgrove getting this off the battlefield. It's bigger than Hogak, and not many things can say that. Faithless Looting will be flashed back. Thought sees among the cards, and that is it. Dominic Harvey is going to win this game and match here over Bobby Colgrove. Two games to one. It's a clean sweep for Mono Green Tron in Professional Magic this weekend, Mythic Championship 4 in Barcelona, and right here in Columbus, Ohio. Take it down, Team Nova and Dom Harvey. And